Okay, good afternoon, everyone in Turkey. Thank you very much for this uh, invitation, the kind of introduction. So after these two beautiful talks on Skirmian fundamentals, my talk will be uh, more on the applied side, how we can control Skirmions for device integration, especially how to achieve deterministic and ultra-fast creation, annihilation, and propagation of magnetic Skirmions. And throughout this talk, you will um, see a lot of the images like this, where a skirmion is depicted in, in as a black uh, circle and it's usually integrated into some nanostructure like a like a track of magnetic material and uh, along this track we can inject uh, current pulses we can apply uh, all kinds of excitation to that so when talking about applications of magnetic skirmions what do we have in mind um, there are a few examples i want to like to show here the first one is, of course, uh, data storage. The uh, most promising application or most known application of magnetic experiments is the Skirman racetrack memory. But data storage, as shown here, uh, but data storage can be even much more simple. For example, as uh, representing uh, the numbers of a count event uh, just by the numbers of skirmions in the device. And that can be used, for example, for embedded memories, uh, which operate at very low um, energy consumption. Uh, Skirmions can also be used for sensors. For example, they react to a magnetic field in a very fast way. And uh, this can be used uh, for sensors required in power electronics, in navigation, in medical applications, and so on. And then Skirmions have also intriguing behavior, um, including some fading memory and connectivity, which might be interesting for realizing neuromorphic computing devices. And all of these applications have in common that uh, it requires uh, a, a nucleation, uh, usually also a propagation, and ultimately also annihilation of magnetic skirmions, typically also on a relevant time scale, and uh, of course, with a determinist, uh, in a deterministic fashion. Uh, there's also a problem of readout, which I will not be addressing in this talk. So the first part is about nucleation. How can we nucleate skirmions? And the, uh, the question is, is kind of tricky because it usually starts with a question of if skirmions are topological objects, how can we then transition between the topological object and the non-topological ground state if, there is, uh, if this is topologically forbidden? Well, the question is simply answered by considering the skirmion live on a discrete lattice. So the topology of the skirmion, instead of being considered as a sort of, for example, donut shape that you want to transform into a sphere, you should rather consider it as a, uh, as a chain like this here, uh, which has a, a, a link where you can open and close the, um, the chain. And this is also illustrating the fact that uh, you can brute force, of course, uh, create or annihilate the skirmion, which costs a lot of energy. But if you have the correct handle, if you know how to open and close this chain on this, uh, on, on this position here, then it can be relatively easy and with, uh, done with low energy. And uh, for this particular talk, I will focus on two uh, device compatible mechanisms that allow such nucleation uh, in a uh, fast and deterministic manner. So that the first one would be spin orbit torque nucleation and the second one would be laser induced nucleation. So for the spin orbit torque nucleation, we need two ingredients basically. The first one is a vertical inversion symmetry breaking of the material. So in this case here, you have a uh, superstructure where you have be, uh, at the first layer, you have a heavy metal, can also be a topological insulator, where you have strong spin orbit interactions. And top of that, you have a magnet. And then the third layer would be a different material that is not magnetic, but also not the same as the one below. So this gives you inversion symmetry breaking that gives rise to this spin orbit torque and also to the gyrosh and schemaria interaction in the material. The second ingredient that you need is then lateral symmetry breaking. So if that film is uniform, you will be, uh, it will not produce any skirmions when you inject a current. So you need some inhomogeneity in lateral directions. So that can, for example, be a defect where locally the magnetic anisotropy is reduced. You can also change any other micromagnetic parameters just locally. So this is now here showing the X and Y dimensions of that strip and here in the Z direction, the anisotropy. So if you combine this and then inject a current pulse of a exceeding a certain threshold amplitude, then you will see that you will actually switch locally the mechanization from up to down near that defect here, 
where the uh, necessary in-plane field provided uh, for the spin orbit torque switching is provided by the jaschinsky moria interaction. You can then, by uh, applying continuous or continue to apply this current pulse, move away this locally switched area, which is not yet a topological uh, uh, object, but is rather a, uh, like just a, a magnetic bubble, you can move that away from that defect. And ultimately, once you switch off the current, because the energy of this defect here is so high, it will um, transform itself into a magnetic scanner. And this mechanism is quite universal. It has been studied by many groups, uh, even a lot of them before um, our publication. And it's not limited to spin orbit torque generation, but this also can also be seen in spin transfer torque. So essentially, the key in, uh, key uh, behavior here is, oh, actually, let me, let me go to the experiment first. Um, the experiment shows that we have uh, determin indeed deterministic nucleation of magnetic skirmions above a certain current threshold. So here we should plot the uh, current pulse length and the current uh, density and the phase diagram resulting from that is that we have above this line here, we have deterministically skirmions and below that line we have deterministically no skirmions after applying the current pulse. And interestingly here, uh, the, uh, you can generate skirmions with current pulses below an nanosecond and at quite reasonable current densities. So that is all device compatible. And the exact function that follows here is very similar to the, or principally identical to the one that you observe for spin orbit torque switching, um, uniform spin orbit torque switching as an MRAM technology. So this is uh, quite well understood. And in the experiment, we can also do imaging. And we see that we, if we synthetically uh, generate a magnetic track where we have a constriction here, and that constriction is breaking the inversion is breaking the lateral symmetry. So this is the um, the point where the skirmish can can then nucleate. Indeed, when we inject the current pulse, we see that skirmish nucleate from one of those corners here. We can move them away by further current pulses. We can also nucleate skirmish on the opposite side of that. Um, constriction and again move the skirmin away from that uh, uh, point. So that's a viable way of uh, nucleate skirmins in a racetrack memory. It is fast, so it's happening on a nanosecond time scale or even sometimes sub nanosecond time scale. And it is defect driven. That's an important point here. So you need this lateral symmetry breaking to nucleate these skirmins. Quite differently from that is the phenomenon of laser induced nucleation. So uh, I, there's a number of differences, but I want to highlight two. The first one is that if we illuminate an initially uh, saturated magnetic sample by a single femtosecond laser pulse, we get a entire uh, like uh, array of skirmins. We get uh, hundreds or thousands of skirmins after that uh, laser pulse. So we have a very high density of, uh, after just one pulse. And if we plot the distribution of these skirmins, so we repeat the experiment over and over again, we plot uh, the, and we overlay all, this, all of these images, we see a image that looks like this one here, where we identify that more or less the distribution of these uh, resulting textures is uh, random. So the remaining variation that you see here is just short knots. So this is a homogeneous process. It does not require defects. And if we look at the time scale of this, we can actually do that at the European Free Electron Laser. And the experiment uh, is like, uh, like that. We put our sample into the um, X-ray beam. We initially start with the sample that is uh, saturated, then expose it to a laser pulse and then to an X-ray pulse. And the X-ray pulse is then um, scattered from this uh, resulting state here and detected on a detector in the far field. And by that recording the Fourier transform of the magnetic pattern here. And uh, we, we learn a lot of things from this experiment, but the main thing I want to illustrate here is that we see uh, when this process has finished. 
So we see when the total intensity of that scattering distribution here has saturated to, uh, to, to its final intensity. And we see that this happens actually in 300 picoseconds. So this process is very fast. So remember that even the simulation that I showed before for spin orbit talk in, uh, induced nucleation took about six uh, nanoseconds. In this case here, for a single skirmish, in this case here, we are nucleating hundreds of skirmians in only 300 picoseconds. Uh, duration. So this process is even faster than, than uh, current induced nucleation. And importantly, it does not require any defects of the material. So we just illuminate a homogeneous material and we still get skirmins out of that. Now, how can we make this, uh, both of these processes then deterministic in terms of uh, where exactly to nucleate the skirmions? And the, uh, one of the answers is uh, we can use helium ion irradiation. And so this is shown here where we have a magnetic track and uh, the upper part of that track is irradiated by helium ions. So to locally reduce the anisotropy of the material, the lower part is not irradiated. And what we see is if we then uh, uh, inject the current pulse, we nucleate skirmions exclusively in the area that has been irradiated by the helium ions. So this is, Kind of the way that uh, I also explained before for um, for the spin orbital current uh, uh, spin orbital nucleation of skirmions, where in the area of uh, where you reduce the anisotropy, you get the skirmion nucleation. You can also do that in line shapes. You can have a a, a line ir uh, of lower anisotropy or irradiated by heliums helium ions. You can have dot arrays where you really produce skirmions only at dedicated dot positions. And interestingly, this also now works for laser nucleation in a certain range of magnetic fields. So in this case here, we expose the sample by a, a femtosecond laser pulse. And what we observe is that the skirmions also then appear exclusively in these areas, which we have irradiated under a certain range of magnetic fields. For the laser-induced nucleation, it's, we can also focus the heat of that laser to certain areas. And um, that, uh, that is also similar to, uh, to previous reports where people have uh, used a uh, tip of an MF, uh, AFM or a plasmonic effects. And here we are showing that you can also use uh, backside reflective masks for uh, tuning where exactly you deposit the heat of that laser. For example, if you start uh, with a sample that has a, a magnetic film here and a transparent layer on top and a metallic layer behind, then in that case, uh, you have matching between the magnetic layer and the metallic layer so that there is more, more light being transmitted and less being reflected at this interface and more being reflected at this interface. You know, when you have a metallic film, um, the metal, to air interface is quite strongly reflecting. So the, uh, the metallic film usually looks like a mirror. And in that case here, when you have more mirror effect on, the, on this part of the material than on this part of the material, you actually see that you expose this here with a high fluence beam. You see that you uh, get skirmits everywhere. Essentially, you overcome this uh, threshold for skirmit nucleation everywhere. However, at low, fl low fluences, only the part where you have reflectance on the backside is then uh, heated above that critical temperature, whereas the part that is uh, where you have then favorable transmission of that light and less reflection uh, is heated less and you get less skirmings. You can actually do it also funnily the opposite way around. You can put the magnetic film, then a transparent layer and then a metallic film and now this interface here between the transparent layer and the next metal layer is acting as a mirror, whereas the transparent layer uh, and the interface to air is producing less reflections. So in that case, you have the exact opposite. At high fluences, again, you produce skirmits everywhere. At low fluences, you produce skirmits only in the outside of the material. You can uh, use that phenomena to uh, nucleate skirmits in a variety of patterns. Uh, for example, um, uh, this grid shape here, or you can even use interference effects of, uh, in this geometry here to produce skirmions in, uh, in um, ordered patterns um, by, uh, yeah, on, on the order of the wavelength of the light. Essentially, uh, this is 
uh, uh, showing a concentric interference pattern between the incident light and the reflected light producing these rings. So this is a, a, a means of achieving deterministic nucleation. Let me show you that this is not limited to femtosecond laser pulse because obviously if we talk about applications, it will be very hard to integrate a femtosecond laser into a device. However, uh, as other groups and uh, have also reported, you can uh, induce experiments by heat even on a slower time scale. For example, this material, uh, this, uh, this report here has shown that you can uh, induce experiments by joule heating of the material on a time scale of a few nanoseconds. This experiment here has shown that if you put a heat element next to the magnetic track here, uh, you can induce uh, a transition from a stripe domain state to a uh, Schirman lattice. So this is uh, on, a, on a even slower time scale. And this is uh, on a very slow time scale in a TEM experiment where they heated this sample uh, statically on a very slow time scale above a uh, crit uh, critical temperature and then cooled down. And when what they see is when they actually exceed the temperature of, uh, of uh, in this case, 650 degrees Celsius, they come back to a high density of magnetic skin. So if they heat slightly below that temperature, they uh, get to a, a state with very low skin density. Okay, now we have uh, looked at the uh, nucleation. Now what about propagation? So here I would also like to pick two examples. The first one is magnetic field induced motion because this is interesting for sensors. Uh, here the experiment is that we have a skirmian containing disc. So this is a disc of a few uh, hundred nanometers in diameter. And around that disc, we put a microcoil to inject a field pulse uh, to generate a magnetic field pulse. This is a simulation of the uh, of the geometry. So here is the current connect, uh, conducting uh, microcoil and it's producing a field on the order of a few tenths of millitesla at this skirmian position. So here are the two skirmians. And here's a time resolved video of what happens to the skirmian state if we apply such a uh, magnetic field pulse. And here you see that the, here's the uh, shape of the field pulse. And you see that the negative pulse is producing a, a new domain here that new domain is actually displacing that skirmion. And upon reversal of the field pulse, the new domain is annihilated and the skirmion returns back to its initial position. And the entire duration of that video is 14 nanoseconds. So this is a very fast and deterministic response to a magnetic field pulse. A, the, an, another type of dynamics is uh, motion of the skirmion over long distances. And that has been proposed, uh, especially by this uh, paper of Albert Fertz group and, uh, and others, that you can use spin orbit torque uh, to drive skirmions very efficiently and very fast. And uh, this uh, experimentally has been realized uh, in this paper here by a uh, group of Jeff Beach, where they have seen that you can actually um, drive skirmions with velocities of uh, 100 meters per second by, I uh, would say, reasonable current densities. It has also been observed uh, by the group of uh, Axel Hoffmann et al. Uh, even earlier than that, is uh, that you can drive skirmets with this means at very low current densities, then, but then also reaching very low um, speeds. So in terms of uh, speed, uh, it's actually very interesting to note that uh, the speed of skirmets ultimately uh, is is limited. And this is something surprising because uh, in the original model by, by Thiele, so if we look back also at these uh, graphs here, you would anticipate that actually the velocity scales linearly with the current density. And this is actually true up to a certain point. And when you drive skirmions then faster, it's interesting to see that here um, you uh, is the skirmion data in, in black and the domain wall data in, uh, in orange, that above a certain velocity, you actually also saturate the velocity of the skirmions. And this is surprising because according to the Thiele model, where you assume that the skirmions are a rigid particle that you just displace by the current but not uh, change its shape, uh, the velocity would not be limited. So why is this so? So interestingly, um, the velocity is also limited 
in micromechanics simulations. And that's shown here. So this is a, a pure simulation plot. Initially, it starts linear with, uh, so this is uh, the regime that's uh, been measured before. So here, uh, the velocity scales linearly with current density, but ultimately it saturates um, to a velocity very similar to that of the domain wall. And the reason being is that as you drive skirmions fast, uh, they ultimately transform into this uh, shape, into shapes like this, which more or less look uh, look more like a, a pair of domain walls and much less like a rigid skirmish. So the assumption that skirmish would be rigid does not hold uh, at very high current densities. So what we find by scanning uh, a variety of different um, material parameters is that skirmish actually never move faster than domain walls. So if you want uh, that's not, not too bad. As you see, the, the velocity that you can reach is still quite high, but you should consider that uh, uh, if you want to have a material where scammers move fast, you need to also realize uh, fast domain wall motion. That's experimentally usually much more accessible. Now coming to the third part, annihilation. Um, so here uh, I propose a mechanism of, uh, of laser-induced annihilation. And uh, the reason is, uh, or, uh, let me show how this works. So uh, essentially, when we when we start at a certain uh, field uh, in, a, in a saturated state, we reduce the field, and then we expose the system to a laser pulse. If the field is low enough, we would produce a scammy state. This is shown here. So this is a, a meter stable um, saturated state that's transformed into a scammy state. Now, what we find is when we increase the field of that same scammy, we expose it again to a laser pulse, we annihilate the skirmish. So the hypothesis here is actually that the laser induced uh, dynamics always transform the skirmish into the, the system into ground state. Essentially you heat it so much that uh, whatever system relaxes to is actually the global ground state of the system. And if we plot here, the energy of the skirmish as a function of radius for various magnetic fields, we can actually analytically understand that as certain magnetic fields, the skirmish state would be the global ground state. And if you increase the field uh, um, or make the field higher, then uh, the skirmish would uh, be a meter stable state higher than the ferromagnetic state at zero, zero, but still separated from that uh, ferromagnetic state by a considerable energy barrier. So it would not annihilate on its own, but rather if you ex uh, expose this to a femtosecond or to a fast, la fast laser pulse, it will actually uh, be excited over the energy barrier and go to the ground state west no scheme. Okay, so we can actually use this to combine everything into one single device. So uh, here we have a magnetic track, we have, we can inject current pulse, we have uh, apply a magnetic field and we can uh, apply a laser pulse. And we start with a uh, magnetic, with the with empty state where there's no skirmion. We nucleate a magnetic skirmion with the current pulse. We then move that skirmion by uh, further current pulses uh, to the left and to the right. And then we annihilate the skirmion again by a laser pulse. And all of this has been performed at a constant magnetic field. So this is quite device compatible. Okay, with that, I would like to thank now all the contributors to this to this work. This has been a combination of uh, several papers. So there's a lot of people involved here. I would like to especially thank uh, Bastian V, Lisa Marie Kern, and uh, Katika Gerlinger and Stefan Eisebit from TU Berlin and uh, the Max Born Institute in Berlin. Um, my postdoc supervisor, Jeff Beach, and uh, co-workers there, Kalitius and Ivan Lemmert, and uh, uh, also from my PhD work that was still uh, the field-induced motion with Christophorus, Mutafis, and Matthias Kloy and uh, more recent collaborators of, uh, in terms of theory, in terms of uh, uh, materials uh, providing. And there was a lot of beam time experiments. I cannot go into all the list of people here, but uh, I would like to thank them very much for their uh, contribution to this. So with that, uh, let me summarize and outlook. So first of all, I uh, hope I convinced you that we have now skirmion, nucleation, propagation, and annihilation quite well under control. Uh, we can actually nucleate skirmions by spin orbit torque or current pulses or heat pulses. So we can produce from a, from a saturated state, we can go to a skirmion state. We can propagate skirmions by, um, by magnetic fields or current pulses. We can annihilate them again by light pulses and integrate everything into a, uh, into a functional device. We can make this deterministic positioning by helium irradiation and the speed is on the order of picoseconds to 
uh, maybe up to 10 nanoseconds. So this is all device compatible. So what is next? Uh, how we can we actually now uh, reach a higher TRL uh, technology readiness level is um, I actually encourage people to think beyond racetrack memory applications, not only because um, racetrack memory is kind of difficult to design, but also because um, there are, I think, better cases where Skirmin can make a unique contribution to a problem that is um, uh, where there is no incumbent technology. So for, for memory, we have, I think, quite good memories, but um, there's other problems in the world that uh, have no technology solution yet. And uh, for that, we also need to communicate better with industry, identify concrete needs, and define use cases. Uh, I think there's, again, a lot of promising um, uh, uh, functionality of Skirmish that we can use for addressing actual uh, problems that exist. We just need to identify what those problems are. And then um, solve the problem of non-invasive read, uh, readout is certainly something that needs to be addressed and solve the problem of temperature stability, uh, meaning that the devices should work the same way at minus 20 degrees Celsius up to 150 degrees Celsius usually. So that is another kind of engineering kind of question that needs to be addressed. Okay, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm very open for questions. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Felix. Uh, comments or uh, questions? Thank you very much. Could you tell us more about the mechanism uh, leading to scar manipulation with uh, the laser pulses, please? Yes. Uh, wait, let me see if I have. Uh... And connected question I mean, uh, uh, what is the characteristic of your uh, initial magnetic layer? I mean, uh, you cannot nucleate whatever the magnetic parameters of your initial magnetic layers, I suppose. Yes, so I think the best slide I have for this is, um, is this one. So the atomistic mechanism is essentially that we, uh, that we remove transiently the topological energy barrier. So the topological, if you here plot the energy as a function of skirmian diameter, then the skirmian would sit here in that energy minimum and uh, the energy barrier here is uh, the one at, uh, uh, that goes from, from this state, the, the, um, uh, the field polarized state at zero, zero to that uh, maximum energy that is between this state and, and this state here. And uh, this energy barrier here is eight pi times the topological torch times the uh, exchange constant times the film thickness. And the mechanism for annihilation here, so this, uh, the problem here is that this, is on the order of several hundred kT at, at room temperature. So there's no way you overcome this by just a random thermal excitation, even if you heat the system with a laser pulse. So the mechanism is different, namely that we actually reduce the effective exchange coupling by driving the system very close to the Curie temperature, not over the Curie temperature because there you have no order, but just just below the Curie temperature, we find a phase where uh, the exchange content is very low. So you can have a rapid changing of topological charge because that energy barrier is essentially zero, but you have still enough exchange to produce a order over a few spins, enough to have a seed for, um, for a magnetic skirmion. And then moreover, our layer system here also ask about the material. So the system here is a multi-layer of uh, cobalt uh, platinum, or uh, uh, in other cases, platinum, uh, cobalt, iron, boron, MG. Uh, and this is a, a succession or a layer of magnetic and non-magnetic materials. And here, what the laser is doing is it's also decoupling all these layers, meaning that the dynamics in one of those is separated from the dynamics of the next one. And then you're reducing the effective layer thickness from the stack of the whole 15 repeats to, this, uh, to the thickness of a single layer. That again reduces the magnetic, uh, the, um, the energy barrier for, to, uh, for um, skirming creation. So that is then essentially the idea of like how uh, the path would be for that laser into the skirming nucleation. So you start at zero, zero, and then you go uh, without having to overcome that energy barrier to the um, skirming ground state. Sorry, but in platinum cobalt multilayer, there is no DMI. 
that's true. And uh, the hypothesis here is that we do heat the system from um, just from above. So transiently, we are actually inducing inversion symmetry breaking. So transiently, the system is hotter on the top than it is on the bottom. And that heat gradient would then step uh, produce a transient DMI that is leading to, to that uh, scale manipulation. To be honest, um, we the atomistic simulation that uh, is currently accessible uh, does not come, uh, is, does not allow to simulate a system like this, especially uh, not, not of that thickness and not of um, the, uh, not with the non-local straight rate interactions. So um, this is a kind of simplified model but we believe that on that uh, on that trend in time scale of a few um, uh, tens or hundreds of picoseconds, that is uh, what is uh, what is driving the, the physics. We actually check that the that the resulting state is purely skirmions. So uh, by Lorentz TM, we check that even in that system which has which has no DMI at uh, at room temperature in equilibrium conditions, it has uh, the laser produces this, a state of exclusively skirmions. Yes, any more questions? Well, maybe just one comment that uh, in principle, even though they are symmetric, there will be net zero DMI, but I think in realistic system, there's always defects, impurities, so they don't quite exactly cancel out. So there could be some- No, that's true, but the, probably the DMI would be small. That's right. Yeah. And then we also, like the, the resulting textures are block type. So at uh, at equilibrium, they are um, they are not nail skirmions, but they are bluff skirmions, meaning that the the DMI contribution to to the um, chirality is relatively small. Yes, Dr. Bittner, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, okay, coffee break now. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye.